Hello, everyone. Did you miss me? Was I know Taylor? Yeah, well, <laughs> just I love Taylor. Taylor, thank you so much for Taylor. Thank you so so much for uh, taking over the last two weeks when I was uh, doing some work related things on, on a little bit of, a little bit of travel and, and uh, things of that nature. So uh, I I, uh, I had a nice time. But it's good to be back as well, too, and, and uh, it's always always great to get back to the questions and, and be with all of you on our Wednesday nights. This this special St. Patty's Day, actually, for for all of you watching today. We'll, we'll do it all in an Irish accent. How does that sound? Yes. Which is what all my relatives sound like when I go back to Ireland. So here we go, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's get started. Steve says, every time I walk into a house, I have to do a mental ritual. And if I don't do it right, have to redo it so that it resets my mind. Well, first of all, do you have to or does your OCD tell you that it would be a great idea? I would say you do not have to because, Steve, if you have to, there's nothing I can do to help you. If you have to do it, then you have to do it. And that's just the way that it is. So we are not here to work on what you have to do. We're here to challenge the notion that you believe that you have to do it. The reality is you do not have to do it because if you had to do it, there'd be nothing for me to do for you. Why do you choose to do it becomes the question. And if the reason you choose to do it is that uh, I will have my mind be off, then be, be with that. Be with your mind being off. Recognize that you can handle your mind being off. Your concept of resetting your mind by doing a mental ritual is a made up thing. That is, that is not a truth. That is not a reality. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't have to ever do anything but do a ritual and then all of our minds would be fine. There would be no problem. There would, there would never be a mental health issue for anyone again. Oh, it appears your mind is off a little. Why don't you do a mental ritual? And then once you do that, you will have reset your mind and you won't have to worry about everything. Everything will be great. Now, that is not how it works. OCD tells you a lie and tells you that that's how it works. But the reality is that that is actually not how it works. So Steve, don't fall for the lie. Stop doing the resetting rituals and allow yourself to learn that you can handle your brain maybe feeling off or not the way that you quite want things to be because nothing bad is actually happening from that. How common is a fear of schizophrenia? I have researched how so much about this fear that I now create and question every thought I have to see if it relates to schizophrenia. It's making me feel anxious. Well, the fear that I would have schizophrenia falls under the what if category, right? What if I get schizophrenia? What if I develop schizophrenia? And could be something then we start to do a lot of research on and we're constantly looking to see, was that a schizophrenia thought? Was that a real thought? What is a real thought versus what's a non-real thought? What's a schizophrenia thought? What's a not schizophrenia thought? Blah, blah, blah. And yes, that can definitely be something that OCD jumps onto. What if I become this or have this? Or we see that with physical illness. We can see that with mental health issues. I, I even had someone who's afraid, what if I bump into someone and we trade brains, right? So you could you could even trade a brain according to OCD. That That is a possibility in the OCD world, right? Remember in the OCD world, everything is a possibility. There's, there's nothing that is impossible to OCD. So if that's the case, OCD can get you to be afraid of absolutely anything and everything because anything and everything is possible when you have OCD. And what I want people to recognize is that possibility does not equal probability. Just because something is possible does not mean it is very probable. Right? But when you have OCD, possible equals probable. And therefore, if it's possible, it's 100% probable. And that means I have to do something about it or else something bad is going to happen. Right? Look at the level of responsibility that OCD throws upon you. 
you are responsible for anything that happens in your life and you can challenge everything in your life and make everything better by just doing some compulsions and satisfying the OCD. You will never have a problem again in your life once you give in to what the OCD wants you to do. Well, that's ridiculous, of course, but again, OCD tells lies and gets you to believe these types of things, and everybody starts falling for it who has OCD. They see that as the truth. So Richie says here, you've struggled with that similar thing and also have become afraid of going crazy or snapping. Be kind and patient with yourself and try not to Google too much. Yes, that's that's always a good idea. Uh, the more research you do on something, the more of a compulsion that becomes, the more likely you're just going to want to keep doing that over and over again as well. Too. Shalanda says, how do I get over harm OCD towards family and coworkers? Well, allowing yourself to have whatever intrusive thoughts or images or urges that you have about harming people and being around those people while you're having them, right? So I guess we'll do what I normally do. It's been a few weeks and maybe Shalanda, you haven't heard me, but Shalanda, there's a potential by the end of this webinar that I will go across the street, burn my neighbor's house down with all of them in it. I will take a poop in the middle of the street, put it into a brown bag, light it on fire, put it on another neighbor's porch, ring the doorbell, and then he'll come out, stomp it out, but then get poop on the shoe. While coming back, I will shoot some migrating birds that cross paths over my house all of the time, leaving a strewn about dead carcass of birds all over the place. And then I will come home and I will just sit in here and laugh about it. Now, guess what, Shalanda? There's a possibility that that could happen. But I'm gonna go with the probability is amazingly low, right? And I've used that example now at least 15 times in these webinars. And so far my neighbors, have not been burned out of their house, and as far as I know, have not been ding dong ditched with a pile of burning poop on their doorstep as well too. Even though I keep talking about it all the time, and I have all the potential for doing it whatsoever, right? So how do you overcome OCD harm thoughts towards your family and your coworker? Stick around your family and your coworker and learn that just because you have them doesn't mean that you're going to do anything to them. Okay. If any of you are home right now with anyone else, you could all do this right now. You could all think about within the next hour, I could go punch someone in my family. Yeah, my wife's upstairs. Within the next hour, I could go upstairs and I could just say, excuse me, everyone. I need to go punch my wife. Be right back. Just give me a moment. And then I could go upstairs and I could do it and I could come back. I could think about that. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it, but I can think about it. And guess what? I'm not afraid of thinking about it because I recognize it as just a thought. And I don't take a look at every thought that I have or image that I have or urge that I have means that it's made me more likely to actually go and do something. And that's the difference between somebody with and somebody without OCD, right? The person with OCD says, well, boy, that could become true. What if I were, that would be awful or horrible. I better do everything that I possibly can to make sure that that doesn't happen. And the person without OCD says, oh, that was weird. And then they go on with their life. Okay. Nick B says, the graph is back. Yes, thank you, Nick. It's good good to see. He says, that's what the kids are calling me these days. I, I like that. Huh? You can call me graph. I've uh, I've had graph. I've had uh, PB McG. That's, that's, uh, that's a good one as well. So lots of, Lots of nicknames uh, that you, you could call me. Getty was my nickname in college. So, you know, all, all sorts of fun stuff. All right. Um, quick question, Dr. McGrath. How do you come up with exposures on the spot? Sometimes I stumble with what I can do when the OCD and the compulsions are both mentally oriented. Is there a simple trick? I think the simple trick, honestly, Nick, is practice. Um, at this point, of doing this for 21 years now, I think in terms of ERP on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just the way that I look at everything is through the lens of ERP. If I'm even not working and I see things happening in my day-to-day -day life, I think about, hmm, 
that could be an interesting exposure and response prevention exercise right right there if if i'm in a store and someone's stocking shelves and and they have a bandage on i i think about oh I know people who would not want to buy that food right there because that person had a bandage on and, and what if what if that was infecting the food in some ways or if if i'm driving and there's someone on a bicycle i think about well i know people who would want to switch lanes right now or or turn down the side street before they came across the person on the bicycle because they'd be afraid they'd run it over so i think that a lot of what you have to do is just a practice erp and continue to challenge yourself of writing down what would be good ERPs in the future. If you use the NoCD app, program those right into the app for yourself to do exercises and allow yourself just to become your own expert at your own ERP. I think you'll find that that will be very helpful. Marcelino says, I feel like my thoughts now, uh, which are almost every minute or so, are self-sabotaging thoughts. I am making up to bring me back into this loop. Is this common in recovery? Yeah, well, of course, shocker probably to no one listening to this, OCD will attempt to sabotage therapy for OCD, right? So OCD will get you to doubt whatever it is that you think or how much are you thinking what you're thinking and why are you thinking what you're thinking and shouldn't you be thinking something different than what you're thinking and, and all of these types of things. So it is it is no surprise to anyone that somebody with OCD, while in the midst of getting some help, might start to experience some self-sabotaging thoughts and wonder, am I doing therapy correctly? What if I don't do therapy the right way? Does that then mean that there's something wrong with me because I'm not doing therapy the way that I'm supposed to be doing therapy? And how can my OCD go away if I don't do therapy exactly the right way? So that would be very, very common as well. A reminder to everyone, tonight's webinar brought to you, of course, by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app that you can get on Google Play or iOS. And you can go to treatmyocd.com or nocd.com and you can get set up with one of our teletherapists. There's uh, I used to think it was over there, but Kaylee sometimes says it's over there. So I, you know, I, I, Kaylee, Kaylee will tell you, but there's a button somewhere around that you can click on as well too. And uh, we'll let you know uh, that you can click on that and you can get in touch with one of our intake and care team members and they will set you up for one of our free calls to see if no CD therapy might be right for you. And we are proud to also welcome our UK members as well. Hello. Chip, chip, cheerio to all of you over there in the UK. And um, we continue to get more and more insurance coverage all the time. So keep checking us out to see if uh, no CD therapy might be right for you. Crusher, you're welcome. I'm always happy to take your questions. Uh, <laughs> Crusher is uh, is is uh, quoting some Rush lyrics to me. Uh, thank you. Uh, one from the enemy within. Things crawl in the darkness. That imation, imagination spins. Needles that your nerves crawl like spiders on your skin. Yes, pounding at your temple. Good stuff. Thank you, Crusher. Always appreciate a good Rush lyric, by the way. Does ERP get to the root of the problem by only addressing the behavior and not the core of the problem, asks Skylar. Skylar, thank you for that question. I think that's a very important question and sometimes why many people who do talk therapy don't like ERP. But I always find it interesting, Skylar, most of the people who come to us come to us from talk therapy and have found that no matter how much they talked about their OCD, it wasn't getting them anywhere. It was the ERP that actually did it. So I don't know, Skylar, that we need to think about it in terms of getting to to the root of the problem. I mean, Skylar, let me offer this to you. Imagine you come in to see me because you have a fear of heights and we spend seven sessions talking about why you're afraid of heights. And at the seventh session, we finally come up with, you know what, Skylar? You fell down a flight of stairs at age of seven and you have been afraid of being more than one story up ever since then. Are you no longer afraid of heights, Skylar? I'm gonna bet you are still afraid of heights. Knowing in this instance where it came from is not as important as what are you going to do about it. And I think a lot of therapists have spent a lot of time with people 
trying to figure out where did the OCD come from, believing that only by first knowing where the OCD came from will we then be able to help you. Now, what I often do is I say to people, at least I did before an OCD and you start protocol, I have said to people, tell you what, let's do ERP. I'll help you with all this OCD stuff. And then at the end of it, if you want to know where it came from, I'll spend time with that. No one ever took me up on the offer because frankly, nobody cared. They were just thrilled that they didn't have the OCD anymore. And that was plenty enough for them. They didn't have to kind of figure out where it came from or why they had it. Okay. So think about that for a while. Daily Art Grind interesting name. Hello, Daily Art Cry, says, how do I deal with guilt from real event OCD? Well, the fact that OCD is on the end of it means that you're dealing with guilt about OCD, not about actual kinds of things whatsoever. Or the guilt is thrown up so much more than anybody else who would have experienced that event would be. So real event, I think, looks at a couple of things. Number one, there's something that actually happened. Or number two, I think something happened, and I think I remember it that way, but I, I can't be quite sure, and so I need to keep going back and back and trying to figure out if that's the way that it happened. Either way, what a useless thing guilt is for so many things, right? So if I cut someone off in traffic last year, how much guilt should I hold on to because I cut somebody off in traffic? Just curious. Is there is there um, a four-day guilt? Is that a seven-day guilt? Should we assign a level of guilt for people to feel for any potential wrong that they could ever make? Is that the way that we should go about this? Or is guilt really helpful? Now, Guilt's a normal, natural human emotion, okay? Uh, obviously. It's not about don't ever feel guilt again. That would be ridiculous. Everybody in the world experiences guilt about things. That's fine. Unless potentially you have one of those personality types of disorders that really gets you to feel no guilt about things whatsoever. But then your OCD can say, well, what if I'm one of those people, right? What if, what if I'm going to do things and I'm not going to feel guilt about it? So now I now I feel guilty about not feeling guilt, right? And, and you can see kind of the ridiculous notion of it there. But um, here's what I'll ask you to think about daily art, right? Does your guilt help you or does it get in the way? And if it gets in the way, is it really helping? No, it's getting in the way. Even though we don't really do many things unless we think they're going to be helpful, right? So OCD might say to you, guilt is a good thing. Guilt will help you to remind you to not do the things that create guilt again in the future. But if you don't feel guilt anymore about those things, then you might be more likely to do those things in the future because now you don't feel guilty about them. Okay. That would be like me following around anyone in the world and just reading off the litany of badness and sins and things they've done. You know, maybe all of us should be assigned a follower and a, and a, and a you know, town crier who just walks behind us and says, the person in front of me at age four told their mother they were fat. At age seven, they gave a slight finger to Sister Mary Lou in Catholic school. You know, one of, one of these or something like that. In, in third grade, they stole Chrissy's Cheetos while she wasn't looking, you know, and where does it end? I mean, where, where do we stop the guilt experience for things for people, right? And what do we actually get out of it? Uh, motivation by guilt is not motivation. Motivation by guilt just puts people down and makes them feel awful and horrible. Now, many people have this notion that I call specialists. The rules of the world apply to me differently than they do to everybody else. Everyone else, I would never, never make anyone else feel guilty. But me, on the other hand, oh, yes, 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 indeed. I can only be motivated by feeling bad. So I need to remind myself of every dumb, stupid thing I've ever done in the world to make sure I don't ever do it again. And that's what will help me be better. But I wouldn't do that for anybody else. I wouldn't remind anybody else of any of the dumb, stupid things they've ever done because I know that it would make them feel worse if I did that. Well, guess what? It'll make you feel worse, too, just so you know. T. Martin, with real event OCD, my subject matter is different. I'm embarrassed of what a therapist would think. Uh, 
Well, that could be something that you use, T. Martin, as a reason to not talk about something, right? Uh, but here's the unfair piece of that. You're assuming that I would think bad about you if you told me something, right? That's your assumption. You're, you're going in with that assumption that I would think bad about you. And the reality of it is, is that you don't know what's going on in my head. So how can you know what I'm thinking? before I even do something. How is that even possible? I'd say it's not. Now, if we reverse that, you'd be embarrassed. Well, it still says there you'd be embarrassed about what a therapist would think. So I'm still gonna go with the idea that you assume the thing that therapists are thinking. But let's talk about being embarrassed for a minute. All right, so you're embarrassed. What can you learn from being embarrassed? Then? Can you learn how to handle being embarrassed? I think you can. I really do. I think you can learn how to handle being embarrassed. And if you learn how to handle being embarrassed, you'll start to feel better over time. And you won't use that as an excuse to stay stuck in OCD. Remember, OCD throws these emotions around all the time to keep you stuck. And you don't want to stay stuck. Alicia says she's on her sixth session and she's doing great with ERP. Nice. But you've noticed after your last session, which was a doozy, you've been feeling a little anxious with no reason and a little irritated, early irritated, but I think maybe you meant a little uh, irritated even. Um, yeah, well, let's direct that irritation at your OCD, number one, because it's your OCD that led you to need this therapy and do all these things and these exposures and everything like that as well, too. So poo poo on your OCD. It's your OCD that's that's the problem, number one, okay? But um, it wouldn't be surprising if you had kind of a doozy of a session that you would now be concerned about what your next session's gonna be like. How will the exposures go in the next session? What will occur in, the, in that session, right? So I think it's normal and natural and in fact, I would be a little, I think, disappointed if people in the midst of really good ERP weren't a little trepidatious about their next session and wondering what it was going to be like and how it would go. So congratulations. You're, I think, exactly where we want you to be. And that's wonderful. Good job. Madison says, can I talk about compulsion OCD? I tend to focus on any mistakes, regrets in my past, and want to go back and disclose things from three plus years, or my OCD tells me to do so. So um, I, don't, I don't know in the sense of compulsion OCD, but I'll say this. OCD is two things. It's obsessions and compulsions. Okay, so, so just to kind of throw that piece out there, number one. But what we're looking at here is the compulsion, it sounds like, that you have is to want to go back and disclose or confess things because then you think that will clear your conscience or clear out any mistakes that you might have made and will help you to not regret things. Well, let's talk about that. What would happen if you didn't do it? You, you might live with some guilt or regret for the rest of your life, okay? And from just kind of a pop psychology idea, well, wouldn't it be great just to not have to do that? So just go back and confess all these things? And yet there may be people, that, and believe me, I've treated this, when people have done this and they tell me about it, pretty much anyone they confess to or make a, you know, talk about a mistake or a regret or something like that, Almost everyone they go up to says, what, what, what are you talking about? I, what? I, I, I don't, I don't even remember that. What you, was I there? Did, did that happen? I, I, I don't even know. OCD typically makes mountains out of the molehills of these little types of things and leads us to feel regret and shame and guilt about all sorts of stuff that almost nobody else gives a crap about whatsoever. So I don't know that you would get out of this experience 
what you might be hoping for that people would forgive you because the reality is the reality is they, they probably don't even remember most of this stuff. It would be more in service of your OCD to do this. And your OCD, once you do this, will then say to you, okay, well, that was round one. Now, now there's these regrets and shames and things we have to do. And, and I think, unfortunately, Madison, you would find the process would never end. And you would just feel compelled more and more over time to keep having to get more and more people telling you it's fine and it's okay and get all the reassurance that you possibly can. So the going back and doing this might just be a great way for your OCD to get reassured. And boy, we know this, OCD's favorite food in the world is a little bit of reassurance sprinkled with some salt on it, right? Uh, a little salty reassurance is just a lovely thing. Sometimes a little sugar and reassurance goes well too, but you know, reassurance is the food of OCD in many, many ways, as are compulsions, right? And substance use can be involved in there and distraction and avoidance. Those, those five safety behaviors that people do are the things that actually maintain OCD and keep it sticking around for longer and longer instead of the thing that leads it to go away. Adrian One Oak, has anyone with harm OCD ever acted on their thoughts? Um, ever? I mean, I, I don't know every single person in the world who's ever had harm OCD, so I cannot give you a 100%, I, uh, uh, absolutely not whatsoever. I can tell you in 21 years of treating OCD, I've never seen it happen, nor do I know any therapist who has ever seen it happen as well. Okay, so that's that's what I can tell you. And you know, one of my favorite exposure and response prevention exercises I ever did with someone who had a harm OCD, who was afraid, what if I push somebody into a train, was after working with her in my office and doing things, was eventually to take her to a train track and I stood a foot from the tracks and I put my hands behind my back and interlaced my fingers and I had her stand behind me and I had her put her hands on my shoulder and I waited for a train to come. And as the train was getting closer and closer, I turned and I, my head and I looked at her and I said, okay, here's your chance. Go ahead and push me into the train. And I just faced forward again and I stood there. And as the train got closer and closer, I started yelling, all right, come on, let's go. Here's your chance. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Why are you not pushing me? Let's go. Chop, chop. And then the train was in front of me and it was like this close to me. And I was like, go ahead. I'm, I'm almost there. We're so close. You just, you just got to give a little nudge right now. Just, just, just give a little, little tiny push. I am off balance. I, I have my hands are not in front. Of me. I won't be able to stop myself. This is your chance. And then the train went by and I said, well, you missed, but we might as well wait for the next one to see what happens with the next one. And after nine trains went by, she realized, huh, I, I guess that I'm not going to push anyone into a train. Okay, great. Wonderful. You did it. Congratulations. Let's, let's move on now. And go home. And and I'll answer the question some of you are asking are thinking to yourselves, well, what if she had pushed you in the train? And the answer is, well, I wouldn't be doing this webinar right now if that was the case. But I went into that with 100 percent trust in two things, exposure and response prevention therapy and the diagnosis of OCD. And then all the work I've ever done with OCD, I haven't seen somebody who's ever done that, who's ever gone and acted on it, right? Is it normal for some harm OCD thoughts to eventually not cause anxiety? Absolutely, Cade, absolutely. Thoughts are still there and distressing, but hardly have a physical anxious response after a month. Yes, Cade, I'm still not bothered by the notion that now within uh, 32, 31 minutes, I could still go upstairs and punch my wife in the face, then go across the street, set my neighbor Dave's house on fire, stop in the middle of the street, take a big poop into a bag, bring it over to Josh's house, light it on fire, hit his doorbell, play ding dong ditch, watch him come out, stomp on the bag uh, that's on fire, maybe catch his foot on fire too, who knows? Then on the way home, shoot a couple of migrating birds that are flying over the house, which could land all over the place in my front yard and on the street, and then come in the house and just laugh about it. Still have 31 minutes of that potential happening. We'll see how it goes. But guess what, Kate? I'm not bothered by it in the slightest. Okay. Element 9 says, hi, McGrath. Hi, Element 9. I'm currently in CBT with ERP. However, I'm having a very hard time keeping my progress. 
so much so I'm actually starting to fall back on things I've had some progress on. Any tips? Uh, I would say, how about instead of currently being in CBT with ERP, how about just being in ERP? You know, you know CBT is great for lots of stuff, but I would say this, if you really want to get the best bang for your buck in the work that you need to do with OCD, just really focus on that ERP. That's the thing to really, really just drive into is exposing yourself to those uncomfortable things and doing response prevention, not giving into those compulsions, those safety behaviors that you normally do and allowing yourself to sit with discomfort and learn that you can handle being uncomfortable. Those are the things that really need to happen. And I think if you do that and you put your efforts really, really into that, you'll see great results coming forward. Reminder, once again, tonight's webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app that you can get on Google Play and iOS. And you can reach out to NoCD for therapy at treatmyocd.com or nocd.com. Or you can hit that therapist button on the app as well. Or somewhere around here, there's a button, I think, too, that you can click on as well. But background, Kaylee, you'll throw that in the comics, I know, and, and let, us, let us go with that. So that will be wonderful. Santa. How do you deal with intrusive thoughts during studying? Well, you study and you allow for the intrusive thoughts to be there and learn how to let them go away. So what this might mean, Anna, is the first few times you're going to be studying, it's not going to go great, right? Why? Because you're so used to probably doing some kind of compulsion to get rid of the thought or the image or the urge, and then it goes away for a little bit, but then it comes back, and then you have to do it again, and then you have to do it again. So you're going to say to me, yeah, but if I let it be there, I won't be able to study. And I'll say to you, yeah, but if you keep doing compulsions, you're also not studying either, right? So which one do you want to do? Keep doing compulsions, which just guarantees that you're going to do more compulsions, or do it my way, not do compulsions, allow yourself to learn how to handle doing it without compulsions, and eventually not needing to do compulsions anymore. My way gives you an out. Uh, sticking with compulsions does not. Compulsions just make the use of more compulsions. They, they don't make things go better. Okay, So you might even practice reading or studying uh, something that's not all that important. Uh, maybe not even an actual assignment from school. Just, you know, I, I'll give you an assignment, Santa. I want you to read a novel and I want you to report back next to me about the first 25 pages of that novel and what the theme of the novel was in the first 25 pages, okay? And I want you to do that without doing a compulsion while you're reading it, even though I told you to study. Let's see how it goes. Antonio, can it become an obsession to always try to escape from ruminating? Sure, anything can become an obsession over time, right? Yeah, uh, or a compulsion. I, in fact, I'd probably put this more in a compulsion, Antonio, than an obsession. Your obsession might be the belief that you need to escape from something, and the compulsion will be attempting to run away from it, right? So uh, just because there are things that you want to run away from doesn't mean that you need to run away from them. You can sit with the discomfort of things without having to run away from them. And that really is what ERP is attempting to get people to do, is to do that. All right. Good luck. Hey, Natalie, I've noticed I have anticipatory anxiety. And when I do my exposure, it's not as bad as I predict it will be. Still not comfortable, but my worst case scenario isn't happening. Well, thank you for saying that, Natalie, because that is just the thing that happens all the time for people who have anxiety-based disorders and OCD, is the anticipation is almost always worse than the actual event, right? Uh, going back again, uh, it, did, did any of you ever read a book? It was a Sesame Street book, and it was Grover. And, and when you open it up, he says, now, don't turn to the next page. There's a monster on the next page. Okay. So when you've turned to the page, he would say, oh, my God. Oh, we got lucky. There wasn't a monster here. But on the next page, there's a monster. And then he would put like, you would see a drawing of, you know, a board was nailed. And it was like, okay, that, that keeps us from turning the page. And then you turn the next page. Oh, oh, there wasn't a monster here. But the next page, there might be one. I heard there's one at the end, toward the end of this book. So don't, don't turn the page. And there was a few more barricades. And the second to last page, of course, there's all this stuff. And there's like the, the Les Miserables barricades up and everything like that. And then you turn the page. 
And there is Grover, and he says, oh, it was me. I'm the monster. Cute, furble, lovable, fur, cute, furry, lovable, little Grover. Yeah. The anticipation was worse than the event. Almost always. Okay. Just the way it works. Joe McGrath says, hi, McGrath. Maybe a cousin of yours. Yes, well, you, you might be, Joe. Hi, welcome, and happy St. Patrick's Day. All right, Element 9 said, again, watched your other lives while you've been working. Uh, fun to see you here again. Oh, well, thank you. It's good to be back. Justin says, sometimes I feel like I'm not catching all my compulsions, and I feel like it may be slowing down my recovery. I'm not really sure how to feel about it. Well, a couple of things here. Number one, I would want to check, is your OCD telling you that you're not catching all your compulsions as a way to kind of just put a, shall we say, a stick in the spoke of the bike wheel uh, and just throw you off of doing therapy, right? So Justin, you don't have to do this perfectly, right? There are some compulsions that are going to slip by, right? That that's That's just going to happen. The goal is not the trend that every day is better than the last. Some days are better. Some days are going to be worse. Some It's it's just going to go up. It's going to be up and down for a lot of things, okay? It's not about making every day better. It's about getting to a point that you're feeling better. And, and that's a journey to, to get to something like that. Uh, as for slowing down your recovery, missing a compulsion here and there isn't going to be the thing that slows down your recovery. The thing that slows down your recovery is going to be all the thinking that you're doing about the fact that you might have missed a compulsion here or there. That's most likely the thing that's going to get in the way more than anything else. So Joseph, allow some forgiveness here. Hey, I missed that one, but next time, what am I going to do to make sure that I catch it? Ah, there we go. That's what's important. I'm going to do this next time to make sure that I catch that. That's what I want you to do, Joseph. Or Justin, sorry. That's what I want you to do. Okay. I was looking up above and saw Joseph McGrath. I was thrown off by the other McGrath on here. So sorry, Justin. But that's that's the thing to do. Haley, how are you? Have you ever experienced dissociation when anxiety levels increased, such as blurred or distorted vision? For example, looking in the mirror and your face seeming to work. Yeah, uh, that happens all the time to people who are anxious to have those kinds of experiences as well. In fact, if you look at the diagnostic criteria for panic, you will see included in there is feelings of derealization or dissociation as well. So it's a common anxiety thing and there are really good exercises called interoceptive exposures that people can do that are specifically designed to get you to feel uncomfortable bodily sensations and learn how to handle them. So things like running in place, hyperventilating, breathing through a straw, spinning in a chair, throat pressure, um, shaking your head back and forth like this, doing all sorts of things that will purposely throw you off bodily and teach you how to handle bodily sensations and not be so afraid of them. So if you look up interoceptive exposure, I'll even put it here in the comments. If you look that up, you will, you will be able to find some good information about uh, how to deal with some of those bodily sensations you're talking about. Megan asks, how do you suggest approaching when family friends react disappointingly to telling them your mental health struggle, e.g. everyone has bad days, it's okay, finding it hard not to ruminate? Well, there are some people who are uncomfortable hearing about other people having a mental health issue. This could be for several reasons. Number one, they have one too, and it is a reminder to them that they have one. Number two, they feel guilty because they're related to you and they think maybe they've been the genetic cause of it in you and therefore now they're experiencing guilt about that. Number three, they don't know what to say, so they blow it off or they change the topic or subject or something because it's too uncomfortable for them to deal with. They don't have maybe the mental capacity or the emotional ability to be able to handle something like that. So they just kind of laugh it off or or they get angry that you even told them that because it's too much for them to bear, right? And they take it they take it almost to a personal level. Why would you tell me something like that? Because now I'm going to have to think about that and deal with that. There's no way, of course, we can predict the way anybody's going to react to things. But that's the beauty of having therapists available in the world who you can talk to these things about, who can really help you deal with them. So that when you do get to a point that you share it with friends or family members, A, 
you can let them know that you've been working on it and are feeling much better. And B, that therapist can help you with whatever reactions those folks might have as well. Cody asks, asks thoughts on retroactive jealousy, OCD. Um, I'm excited that I'll, uh, to, to do some more looking into this one. Personally, I, I've not treated really anyone who has this and I, I've heard more about it lately. Uh, it's interesting how OCD comes in some themes. So, uh, Cody, come back next week and let me let me do a little bit more work on that one and check it out. But just a few basics, of course, you know, OCD will latch on to anything, right? And will lead to jealousy about even the most minor of things. Uh, I do remember one case that came in and it was a male, this boy, this was 20 years ago, I remember this who was uh, in his 70s and he was angry at his wife because when she was 15, she had gone on a date before he met her and she had kissed a boy when, when uh, she was 15 years old. And he was still angry at her over the fact that at age 15, she had kissed another, another boy. Uh, so this kind of goes into Dawn's question below, maybe a little bit too, about how do you help somebody stop ruminating? I, I think when people get jealous, they're trying to maybe figure out why somebody did something, what was the purpose for it? And then they start comparing themselves to, to someone else or something else. Were they as good or as right or as handsome or as tall or, or, or whatever? in those situations and how could how could so and so have liked this quality about that person but i don't have that quality does that mean they don't like me or they they wish i had that quality there's just so many way, ways that jealousy can go and ocd can grab onto those things and now self-doubt comes into place and intrusive thoughts about doubting myself and wondering if i'm good enough or comparing myself, you know, that person was taller than me or skinnier than me or or whatever it, it might be and how I make comparisons in some of these types of things. And I can, can be so jealous of the fact that the person that I'm with now liked that and thought that that was great and I don't have that. And what does that say about me? There's, there's just so many ways that we can go with that. But I'll get some more on that for the next time. And in terms of how can I help my son stop ruminating, uh, Don, I, th I would say one of the things that I would want to ask you, of course, is are you participating at all in answering some of the questions that your son comes up with? One of the things that I've said for family members to do that can be very helpful for people who have OCD is to start what I call a worry journal. If the person with OCD asks you a question, you write the question down and then you write the answer down. And then if they ever ask you the question again, you point to the book and you say, that's in the book. Now, you do that on the second time they ask you the question. The first time they ask you something, you can give an answer, right? The second time they ask you the same thing, you don't give an answer because now we're just going through reassurance and, and that's not what we want to be providing to people. So you want to get this worry journal going and let your son know that all answers are in the book. If he wants answers to things he's asked already, you will never be talking about them again. You will only be referring him to the book and he has to go to the book and find them and check them out there. Madison said, can I talk about confession OCD? I tend to focus on past regrets, mistakes, and I want, oh, I think we did that one a little bit already, so uh, we got that. Uh, Joe asked, Doc, recommend ending antidepressants. I've tried several. Curious if you've heard of any good stories about it in particular. Uh, in terms of it, you know, the, one of the older medications for OCD, clomipramine, is still from a research stand shows some of the best results, but it's not one that they go to at first because it's a uh, tricyclic, which means it has more side effects. But it does remind me, I'm, uh, let me make a note here that I will get uh, Jamie on here, Dr. Jamie Foistner, and he is one of our psychiatrists. So he's our chief medical officer actually here at NoCD. And I will bring him on to the podcast here as well too. So just made a little note for myself, Dr. Jamie Foistner, our chief medical officer. We'll get him in here for that. 
Colin asks if themes can shift in ERP as ERP begins to lower your anxiety surrounding existing themes. 100%, Colin, always uh, not, not uncommon whatsoever. Happens a ton of times, yes. So don't be shocked by it. Don't be surprised. In fact, now that you've been dealing with the thing that is the current soup du jour, right? Uh, other soups that you served in the past might come back up now that you've dealt with the current thing. So sometimes people will be a washer and then suddenly they think one day they didn't check something and it's like, oh my gosh, now I got to go, I got to go take a look at that. And then, um, you know, they, they go uh, for a while being very concerned about, about the checking. And then, then it's like one day, Oh wait, there was there was a kid there, and I might have had a dirty thought about them, and now now that's the thing. And so, don't be surprised if you work on that one. Those other ones that used to be the most awful, horrible thing in the world until this thing showed up, now suddenly become the most awful, horrible thing in the world again because now you've dealt with this thing that surpassed it at one point in time. The good thing is, doesn't matter what's going on, you're going to use ERP no matter what the theme is. So always keep that in the back of your head. What's the ERP that I'm going to do in this situation to help myself get through this? Okay. Megan says, I'm currently struggling with POCD and I'm purposely bringing up very inappropriate sexual thoughts to see if it bothers me. I feel awful because I did this, not OCD doing it. Any tips to stop this? Well, Megan, that's in some ways what we might be doing in purposely in ERP is having people purposely think about things and recognize that just because I think them doesn't make them true or real or mean that I'm going to do them or anything like that. But of course, no matter what kind of OCD you have, you think, well, but this is the worst kind of OCD and this is the worst thing that anyone could think of. It. No one should ever purposely think of these things. And Megan, I'm just going to go along the line of, again, a thought is just a thought, right? That's all that it is. Or an image is just an image or an urge is just an urge. They don't make me do anything. And so I can think anything that I want to. It doesn't mean that I'm a bad person for having thought it, right? Or had an image of it or an urge of it. But when I have OCD, I am a bad person for having thought it or having an image or an urge of it because I'm not supposed to. So OCD basically says this, while awake, you are supposed to be in total control of everything that runs through your head at all times. While sleeping, if you have a dream, it might be kind of bad, but maybe give you a pass on that one. But while awake, you should be in total control of everything that runs through your head. Now you're going to say here, Megan, but I'm, I'm purposely bringing these things up in your head. Okay. And Megan, are you beating yourself up for doing it? Or are you allowing yourself to maybe use it as an ERP example and allowing yourself to recognize, well, I just thought of that. Didn't mean I did it. And turns out I didn't really like it. Hmm. Okay. Guess what? Great learning can occur from that kind of experience, Megan, if you allow for it to occur. Instead of just bringing it up and then feeling bad about it and then doing the compulsion to try to make it go away. Okay. See how that works. Skyler said, would you recommend MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, along with maybe ERP treatment? Well, here's the deal. <laughs> um, if you're going to do any other things in addition to ERP, that's really up to you, but don't do them while you're doing ERP. As in, in the midst of doing an exposure and response prevention exercise, don't do relaxation or mindfulness or anything else. You can do those things outside of the time that you're doing purposeful ERP exercises, but not in the middle of doing ERP exercises or else it becomes a distraction from the ERP exercises that you're doing. And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to be distracting from those things. We want people to be fully engaged in those experiences. That's what's, that's what's really important. Okay. Lisa says, why do sometimes when I am having an OCD anxiety attack and my OCD tells me that I need to do a compulsion, then after I do it, I have no idea why I did it in the first place. <laughs> and then she says, I missed you the last few weeks. Thank you, Lisa. Well, uh, Lisa, this might be that OCD's goal is to just get you to do the compulsion, right? And once you start doing it, it's like, oh, Thank you. That's awesome. I don't even remember what all that tension was from, but boy, it just feels so good to get the relief from it, whatever it was. That could be what's happening. So your goal, of course, Lisa, is to not do the compulsion. Right? Once you stop doing the compulsion, 
That's when OCD goes away. I mean, that's what our name is. No CD really stands for no compulsive disorder, right? Uh, that was Stephen's concept of it when, when he started the whole, the whole idea here. How can we get people to stop doing compulsions? How can we get people to do response prevention? That's the goal of all of this. So do your response prevention. And this question is moot in many ways. You won't have to be concerned about it. Alina says, hi, I have a question. Can intrusive thoughts feel real? Yes, uh, they totally, totally do. Otherwise, they wouldn't be intrusive. If they were just cartoons, you'd be like, well, that's weird, but whatever, you know. Uh, it, it just think about it from the nature of an intrusive thought. It's going to feel real. And if OCD didn't feel real, nobody would have OCD. You know, they come in my office and yeah, you know, I had this thought about running someone over in my car. <laughs> Whatever. You know, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. It's good to good to see you again today. Thank you for thank you for coming in, chatting. Uh, I know that you pay me this uh, money just to sit here and have a, a fun chat for an hour. No, and that's not what it is. OCD has to feel real, or else it wouldn't be a disorder, right? So of course it's going to feel real. How could it feel anything but feel real? It has to feel real. Okay. So you say there, uh, Alina, you're so scared that it is not an intrusive thought and that you agree with the thought. You and pretty much the other 77 people on this webinar right now feel the exact same way. In fact, uh, it looks like all of you have a thumbs up opportunity. So if, if you could all, if, if anyone agrees uh, with that right there, that you're afraid of things not being intrusive thoughts or images or urges, but that they're real, could, could you maybe hit the thumbs up button for me and just let's see uh, if if lots of other people are agreeing with that statement as well, too. Well, so we'll see. You'd have to find the thumbs up button first. I don't even know where it is personally, but I, I'm sure some of you have found it because I see a few of you have done it already. All right. Let's go on to a few other things here. I'll go down here. Oh, yeah, there we go. Thumbs ups, thumbs ups everywhere. I see them now. Thumbs up. Yep. Some yeps. Yep. Thumbs up. All right. There you go. Nikita says, thank you for saying what you said about OCD themes coming up. That is exactly what I suffered with to this day. It always helps so much to hear a similar story. Yeah, it happens all the time. So just, just know that out there, that that's just the way that's going to be. Mike says, OCD is a dirty little liar. Yes, that is true. That is what it is. Mm -hmm. All right. Ashmita has a couple of, of questions here, so let me get to those. Um, what if having thoughts of kicking a dog developed to harming your loved ones, etc., and then you started having those thoughts so long that now you are convinced you are a psychopath or something, and now you have an identity crisis because you keep trying to see if you're good or bad when having harm OCD for so long convinced you are nothing but bad. And even if you have human emotions like jealousy or anything, that you are even a little bit on the negative side, right after thinking it, your brain goes, you're a psychopath and it's attacking all your thoughts. Um, yeah, welcome to OCD. Congratulations, you, you figured it out. Um, I find it interesting, the obsession about being bad. So I'm wondering, what, what does it mean to be bad, right? Who's, who's worse, if you had to judge it? Somebody who does harm their family members or somebody who has an intrusive thought about harming their family member? Is there actually a difference between a person who has intrusive thoughts about harming their family and a person who does harm their family? Or are they the same? Are they 100% identical? And if that's the case, we are woefully lacking in jails here in our world because there are plenty of people. I mean, I should be in jail right now for even saying that I'm going to go across the street to my neighbor's house. I'm going to throw a Molotov cocktail into it. I'm going to burn it down. Then I'm going to take a poop in the middle of the street, put it in a bag, light it on fire, put it on my other neighbor's house, ring the doorbell, ding dong, ditch him. He's going to come out, stomp on it. The fire's going to go out, but then his pants are going to be on fire with flaming poop on him. And then on the way home, I'm going to shoot a bunch of birds who are going to be laying around in the street. Then And I'm going to come home and just smile. I should now be arrested for that thought. 
if a thought is as bad as an action. So I've got five minutes left here. We'll see if the police show up, if anyone wants to send the police to my house for having just announced that I might actually do one of those things, okay? Let's see. Let's see. No doorbells yet. Now, how many of you hate me and will never come back to the webinar because I've said that? Because according to Ashmita, what you've said there, I'm a terrible person. I'm a just freaking awful human being for having said those things that I would that I would even have the thought, the audacity to even have the thought that I just said out loud and that I would, how dare I even contemplate something of that nature? I must deserve to go to jail or hell or whatever else place we can think of because of how bad of a person I am for having thought that. Or I'm a human being and we think stuff all the time. I mean, geez, look at the people who write horror films and all the stuff they think about. Uh, look at look at every police show on television right now, which involves murder, 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 murder right? Every one of those writers, they're going to jail and hell or wherever else, whatever we could think of, that would be the worst place for any of them to go because they're disgusting, awful, horrible people for even having the thought, much less the thought of it. Then they wrote it down and then they filmed the stuff and then they forced us to watch it on television. What awful people they are. Or they're writers. One, one or the other. It's one or the other. And this goes back to that specialness idea again. It's fine if anybody else has these thoughts, but it's not okay for me. I'm a just dirtbag for experiencing these things, but it's okay if everybody else does. That's fine. I, I would never judge you know, anyone else. I'm totally, totally, totally okay for you. Not okay for me. Totally okay for you, though. No, no worries whatsoever. Oh, oh, honey, honey, it's okay if you think that. It's, that's fine. I mean, I, I could never think that. That'd be awful if I thought. But for you, it's okay. No problem. Don't worry about it. And 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 that's kind of the hypocritical nature of OCD. OCD makes you be a hypocrite in some ways, right? OCD says, you have to live up to a different standard than everyone else in order to be better than everyone else. And when we do that, it's not a great way to live. It just doesn't work. Okay. Madison says here, my partner told me I'm not a bad person. Hitler was a bad person. When he said that, I thought, wow, OCD truly made me feel so horrible for decades over trivial things. It's truly BS. Yeah, it's BS. That's exactly right. It's total crap. Okay. And that's what OCD does. OCD leads you to feel as if you are the biggest scumbag that's ever lived on the face of the earth when you have some of those kinds of things, okay? I want all of you to challenge yourself this week. Do something uncomfortable. Allow yourself to learn that you can handle it. Sit with a thought that you don't like. Hold an image in your head that you don't care for. Go about doing things even though you have urges to do harm or something or whatever it might be. Cough, spread COVID, who knows? And allow yourself to realize that those thoughts, those images, and those urges are just thoughts and images and urges. And that's all that they are. And be okay. This is our goal, right? Be okay without knowing 100% everything. I'll leave with one here. Uh, JS said, can harm OCD make you doubt your intentions? Of course. I feel horrible for not knowing if I'm capable of doing the thought or not. Uh, I'll tell you right now, JS, you are capable of doing, right? We're all capable of doing anything that's uncomfortable. Every one of us is capable of doing anything that OCD would bring up. But just because we're capable of it, or just because it's a possibility, does not mean it's a probability. 
And there's the difference. All right, everyone? There's the difference. Have a great week. I'll see you again next week. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Top of the morning to you, if you're, well, it's top of the evening to you, I guess it would be. Be well, be good, be nice to yourself. Challenge your OCD. It's a jackass. It needs to go away. I hate it, and I will continue to do this until it's all gone. Good night.